talks over Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act seemed stalled earlier this summer, but as we know, a side deal between Senators Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin was being made that put the IRA back on track to being passed. The deal would have included overhauling the permitting process for energy infrastructure, allowing for approval of a gas pipeline in Manchin's home state of West Virginia. But this key part was left out despite reassurances to Manchin and opponents on both sides of the aisle aren't sold, which could actually end up derailing the private deal. Here to discuss what all this means for Manchin is journalist for the American Prospect, Lee Harris. Lee, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you here. So tell us more about what was in uh, this, this private deal to kind of you know, whet uh, Joe Manchin's appetite for legislation. I mean, the first thing to say is that we still don't have bill text. So anyone who tells you exactly um, that they know exactly what's coming in it um, uh, is fooling you because only Manchin and Schumer seem to know exactly what's in it. But this leaked one pager that we do have says, first of all, that the permitting deal would prioritize 25 or more critical energy infrastructure projects. So that could be critical minerals, electrical transmission, renewables, fossil fuels. It also specifically has a line item for the Mountain Valley pipeline. That's the stalled natural gas pipeline in Manchin's home state of West Virginia that would carry Marcellus Shale, uh, Mar Mar Marcellus Shale natural gas um, to, to Virginia. And Important to note that not just um, the investors in that project have given to not just Manchin, but also to Schumer, who was instrumental to this deal. Um, now, uh, the, overall, it's being called a permitting reform deal. And I think we should get into why some kind of center left Democrats or even progressives are potentially in favor of permitting. But the important thing to note here is that the deal takes more than 50 votes. That's why it was left out of reconciliation. It'll take all of progressives and then 10 more Republicans or progressives may defect. So the interesting thing we're seeing right now politically is that the deal could unravel given that it was this kind of backroom deal struck uh, between Manchin and Schumer, but both Republicans and progressives are increasingly d d describing qualms that they have with it. So the idea was that this, this deal was required, you know, that, that the IRA was contingent on, uh, that, that, that Manchin rather being on board with the IRA was contingent on this deal being passed, although there was nothing that he could do to actually, you know, guarantee that given that the IRA is already passed, is the belief that because it does have things that are advantageous for conservative interests in it, that he will be able to get people to cross the aisle to support him, even if some uh, progressives uh, aren't supportive. I, I saw, for example, you, you wrote that Rashida Tlaib said that handshake deals made by others in closed rooms do not dictate how I vote, and we sure as hell don't owe Jan Joe Manchin anything now. He and his fossil fuel donors already got far too much in the IRA. Yeah, the belief is that the enormous amount of pressure for this bill from industry will see it across the finish line. Mm. And I think it's important to describe why um, the fossil fuel industry wants this bill so much right now. Because there are some Republicans who are bitter over the passage of IRA, which they didn't expect to happen. Lindsey Graham, for instance, said, I will not vote for a continuing resolution. That's the bill that it's supposed to be attached to. It's part of a political payback scheme. So Republicans are pretty bitter and some of them would be happy to defect. But mm. they're, because, because they say, if we take the house, we can pass our own permitting bill um, on our own terms in a couple of months. However, they're under huge pressure from the fossil fuel industry to do this right now because gas producers really want to export American gas to Asia and especially Europe that has obviously been desperate for gas since the Ukraine war. So since they see energy traders making a killing right now, U.S. producers really want to get in on the action. And it's interesting. It's really a gas push. So oil traders like Chesapeake, which was kind of synonymous with the shale oil boom, have completely ditched oil to get into gas right now. They're gearing up for this huge global gas export boom. But in order to do that, in order to scale up gas exports, they need more big gas infrastructure like liquefied natural gas terminals. Um, and those terminals are built to last, you know, 25 years. Um, anyway, the, the worry from um, both a fi climate perspective, but also just from a financial perspective, is that there's this mismatch between short-term and long-term desire to scale up gas, mm. where 
Europe needs tons of gas right now, but it's also trying to get off gas in the long term. So when this crisis fades, if we build out big new gas infrastructure, that leaves us potentially with stranded assets. Um, and I think in that world, U.S. producers will just try to create sustained demand for gas, right? They'll just try to force a market. Anyway, that all that huge desire to build out gas infrastructure right now explains why Republicans are under so much pressure to go with this permitting bill, despite their reservations and their desire to do their, their own version. There's also an interesting dynamic on the Democrat side we should get into. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Tell us. <laughs> so, um, again, like I said, we don't know a whole lot about what's in this permitting bill, but there's a set of um, of, of climate people who say, rightly, that in order to deliver on the huge financing available to set off this clean energy boom um, that, that was passed into law with the IRA, we're going to need permitting reform, right? There's now tons of money to build clean energy infrastructure, but the process is still gun gummed up with tons of red tape. And that has a truth to it. Um, it. It does take a huge amount of time to get projects approved. So those a set of kind of clean energy wonks are saying finally um permitting reform and, and and the one pager that i mentioned does include things like uh shortening the amount of time that um uh, that a project can be reviewed under key environmental laws like nepa so without knowing a whole lot more this a, a contingent of clean energy people have basically said we love it it's permitting reform let's pass it if there's some fossil fuel infrastructure that gets mixed in, we'll also see clean energy infrastructure like electrical transmission lines and other big scale clean energy. But that seems like a really dangerous bargain because mm. permitting reform can have tons of spin put on it. I mean, President Trump undertook permitting reform when he rolled back a bunch of environmental laws. And the thing to remember about these environmental laws that can be that can cause delays and red tape in standing up energy infrastructure is that they're also the only tools that poor people have to to fight back when a big new polluting project is proposed in their backyard. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Probably we do need permitting reform in order to stand up any kind of new energy infrastructure, including clean energy infrastructure. But on the other hand, environmental laws do protect the poor. And also if you're a powerful energy interest, you've probably been able to use money to get a lot of what you want over the past decade. I mean, the whole fracking boom happened despite our supposedly, you know, impossible tangled in red tape permitting process. Hmm. So anyway, that leaves this debate between environmental justice groups on one side who, who, who represent, you know, um, uh, poorer and blacker neighborhoods um, that don't want this stuff in their backyard saying, just opposing the permitting reform outright and kind of the climate wonk segment who say, no, we need some version of permitting reform. Let's just go with it. That's the kind of crude version of the standoff. What we really probably need is smart permitting reform. And we don't yet know what's in this bill. Mm -hmm. But all of that means that politically progressives uh, like uh, Rashida Tlaib, who my story mentions, who has a lot of Michiganders in her district uh, who say they're really sick of polluting infrastructure um, in their backyard, saying we're not going to just vote for this permitting bill that was a backroom deal between Manchin and Schumer anyway. And isn't it the case that, I mean, you mentioned the various kinds of communities that are disproportionately affected, but uh, the Mountain Valley Pipeline is controversial in West Virginia as well because of the potential threat that it poses to uh, aquifers and water sources in the state. Uh, moreover, there's an argument that given you know how Democrats are celebrating the IRA as a climate bill, it's counterintuitive to say you're going to meet all these climate goals when the, when the Mountain Valley pi Pipeline would have the, about the same, would result in the same amount of emissions equivalent to 26 U.S. coal plants or 19 million passenger vehicles a year. How does any Democrat who wants to celebrate the climate advantages of the IRA square the idea of also voting for this pipeline? I mean, you said it. The thing is, it's no huge mystery why Manchin was unwilling to vote for Build Back Better, unwilling to vote for the Democrats' climate and tax deal. And then when the progressive tax reforms were significantly scaled back and uh, child tax credits and, and a number of other wins for the welfare state and the most ambitious climate goals were taken out and instead it was loaded up with fossil fuel subsidies, uh, why he then 
uh, signed on to the bill entirely on his own terms. Actually, the, the permitting bill um, had the watermark of the American Petroleum Indu uh, uh, Institute, the, the, the oil industry group, on it. So all of that's to say it's a real mixed bag of good and bad. It seems like it's really hard to model out how a bill this big and complex plays out. But, um, but I personally uh, set a lot of store by the modeling that says, including all of those uncertainties, this amount of investment in clean energy just sees a massive scale up in cheaper, cleaner energy over the next couple of decades. Hmm. Um, but it went hand in hand with a number of concessions to Manchin and those should be taken seriously. But doesn't that match the mood of the country, which is so gas prices focused, energy prices focused, you know, at a time where the Biden administration's um, sort of policies, I think, regarding that are very confused at, you know, on, on one hand, continuing to support Ukraine and, and keep, you know, keep the conflict kind of going, which is a big part of what we're experiencing. And then also, you know, going to other countries like Saudi Arabia and saying, hey, can you give us more gas? Although yeah. we're supposed to be getting off gas, all that, like it's, it's a short term. It's like, yes, we need to, we need more gasoline infrastructure. We need to bring down those prices. But long term, clearly the administration is saying, no, we're, you know, we're all about green. We're all about everything else. If this permitting bill goes through, I think one shorthand way to think about the deal that was struck over the last couple of weeks is domestically, it's a clean energy boom. And it also says to the fossil fuel industry, go make up all of the lost gas from the, the uh, Russian gas exports. Um, let the, U the US become the global supplier of, of gas and fossil fuels to the world. Um, potentially as you lose your uh, domestic market for fossil fuels to the clean energy boom that we're setting off at home. I think in some ways that's, that's the trade-off that was worked out and there's certainly some hypocrisy to it. Yeah, I think that's such an important point for the entirety, I think, of this kind of gas crisis, the inflation crisis, and the ongoing conversation about prices at the pump, there has been a tendency to conflate uh, opening up pipelines and drilling in the United States with the ability to actually address that particular concern. And the issue is that a lot of the drilling that people are talking about in the U.S. is for natural gas or the kind of products that don't go into your car or that need to be refined elsewhere before going into your car. So the cause, the, the cause and effect that people are postulating between the idea of like drilling, baby drilling, <laughs> in, the, in the short term aren't calculated for that, as, as you explained, Lee, they are, you know, the push here is about taking advantage of international markets, which you can say is an advantage for the United States for other, you know, economic, broader economic reasons, but isn't calculated to actually helping individual voters and consumers the way that Democrats might be looking to as they head into a midterm season. This is a, a fascinating story, and I really appreciate the detail here in, in your reporting and helping us to understand the procedural posture here. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. We'll have more rising for you after this.